As the Commission's ecologist, Dr. Engel and I are responsible for evaluating wetland delineations supplied by applicants to ensure that they are based on the Coastal Act and the Commission's regulations, that standard field methods have been employed, that adequate data have been uh, collected, and that delineated wetland boundaries accurately reflect those data. Based on this technical evaluation, we make recommendations to you. The purpose of my presentation today is to provide you with an overview of technical wetland delineation in the coastal zone, an appreciation of some of the complexities involved, and an understanding of the basis upon which we conduct our evaluations. At the risk of tautology, it's important to emphasize at the start that an excess of water controls the abiotic and biological characteristics of wetlands the physical and chemical features of the soils, and the types and abundance of the plants and animals that occur in the wetlands are largely determined by the frequency and duration of flooding or ponding or near-surface soil saturation. In well-drained soil, the pore spaces surrounding individual soil particles are filled with air and interconnected to the atmosphere. When soil is saturated, all the soil pores are filled with water excluding air, and when an area is flooded or ponded, the soil is isolated from the atmosphere, which prevents atmospheric oxygen from entering the soil pores. Under these conditions, oxygen cannot easily be replenished, and in the process of decomposing organic materials, such as dead plant debris, bacteria soon exhaust the residual supply of oxygen in the soil and in the pore water. This shifts the soil environment from an aerobic oxidized state to an anaerobic reduced state, and anaerobic bacteria continue the decomposition process, but at a slower rate, which results in an accumulation of organic materials near the surface uh, in frequently or continuously saturated soils. Where the rate of plant production exceeds the rate of decomposition, organic soils such as peat may form. This decomposition of organic materials results in chemical reactions called reduction and oxidation, which occur when atoms gain or lose electrons, respectively. The redox reactions associated with bacterial respiration result in predictable chemical changes in the soil. Initially, oxygen is reduced with water as a byproduct. After the oxygen is consumed, nitrates in the soil are reduced to nitrogen gas, and when most of the nitrates are exhausted, the reduction of manganese oxides commences, and this is followed by the reduction of ferric iron compounds to the non-oxygen containing ferrous form. Sulfates in the soil are then reduced to hydrogen sulfite gas, well known for its rotten egg no odor, and finally carbon dioxide is reduced to methane, also called swamp gas. In seasonal wetlands, these redox reactions are reversed when the soils dry and once again becomes oxygenated. The redox reactions involving iron are the most important in the context of wetland delineation because they result in long-lasting physical changes in the soil. The oxidized form of iron is not soluble in water and is responsible for the yellow, brown, and red colors that are commonly seen in soils. Black colors in mineral soils are usually organic staining. However, dark colors can also result from redox reactions. The reduced ferrous form of iron is colorless and is soluble in water. As a result, the color of reduced soils is different from the color of oxidized soils, even when iron is present. In addition, since soluble ferrous iron can move about in the soil, iron tends to be leached out of frequently saturated soils. This produces long-lasting changes in the color of the soil. In seasonal wetlands, the soil goes through repeat, repeated cycles of oxidation interspersed with periods of saturation and reduction. This causes the translocation of iron, producing areas of iron depletion and areas of iron concentration that are commonly referred to as models. <clears throat> These long-lasting physical soil characteristics are important for identifying wetland or hydric soils. In addition, the rotten egg odor of hydrogen sulfide gas is a sure sign of current reducing conditions. The redox reactions that result in chemical and physical changes in soils also have profound effects on the plant community. In general, the byproducts of anaerobic bacterial decomposition of organic materials are toxic. So plants living in waterlogged soils must cope with both a lack of oxygen and the presence of toxic substances. <clears throat> 
As a result, plant species that are capable of growing in wetlands have evolved special adaptations, including structural and functional responses to the presence of waterlogged soils. Some adaptations may be characteristic of all individuals of some species. In general, however, among species that have evolved the ability to cope with the stresses of an anaerobic environment, only those individual plants that are actually growing in saturated soil react with metabolic and morphological coping mechanisms. For example, the normal roots of many species die back when the soil is saturated, and new roots, called adventitious roots, develop near the waterline uh, where oxygen is available. Species capable of this adaptation develop adventitious roots within a few days or weeks of continuous inundation or soil saturation. Among the wetland adapted species, a very common response to water logging or flooding is to selectively dissolve cell walls and roots and stems, which creates air spaces called orenchyma that allow air to diffuse into the roots. This may take several weeks to accomplish. Some species are also able to increase the rate of diffusion of oxygen into the root channel or rhizosphere. This causes protect protective oxidation reactions that remove from circulation the toxins produced by the reduction of manganese iron and sulfate. It also coats the root channel with iron oxide, which gives it a reddish coloration. These oxidized rhizospheres are persistent and provide evidence of reducing conditions. Clearly, an excess of water is the one wetland feature upon which all others are dependent. This is reflected in all wetland definitions before discussing the implications of the wetland definitions in the Coastal Act and the Commission's regulation, I'd like to distinguish between wetland definitions, wetland parameters, and wetland field indicators. These are common terms in the context of the technical delineation of wetlands, but they are often confused or misapplied. Wetland definitions are broad general statements of the essential properties of wetlands. Although all wetland definitions are based on recurrent conditions of excess water, there is no single scientifically correct definition. This is because all wetlands occur along a moisture gradient. There is an obvious gradient when one goes up a slope from a perennial pond. However, there is also a moisture gradient among seasonal wetlands defined by the frequency and dura duration with which the soil is saturated or covered with water. Although there are logical, objective places at which to draw the line between uplands and wetlands, there is no correct location. This is also true of the organisms that occur along the moisture gradients. Some species are only found at the extremes of the gradient, whereas others show broad tolerances. This is shown by the distribution curves labeled A to E in the slide. The implied frequency and duration of flooding or water logging varies greatly among definitions. This is apparent when one compares uh, <clears throat> definitions in common use in the United States and Australia. The most frequently used definition in the United States was developed in the context of the Federal Clean Water Act and requires sufficient water to support vegetation adapted for saturated soils. For California's coastal zone, the Corps of Engineers interprets this requirement to mean 14 days of continuous inundation or saturation during more than half of all years. In contrast, the Australian definition is designed to protect wildlife and simply requires sufficient water or water logging to, quote, affect the biota. This expansive definition includes dry lakes in arid regions that hold water infrequently. Most of those lakes contain water every three to five years, but the definition includes lakes that are important to water birds, even though they may only fill once a century. The language of most wetland definitions is too general to provide the guidance necessary to actually identify and delineate wetlands on the ground. Greater detail is provided in what have come to be called wetland parameters. Wetland parameters are specific attributes of wetlands that are the basis of wetland delineation. It is generally accepted among scientists and regulators that there are three wetland parameters, one or more of which must be present to meet the various wetland definitions. The primary parameter upon which all wetland characteristics depend is wetland hydrology, that is, an excess of water. The secondary parameters are wetland biota and wetland substrate. And for both the federal and California state regulatory purposes, these terms are more specific. Wetland substrate means hydric soil, 
and wetland biota means wetland vegetation or hydrophytes. These three wetland parameters are defined attributes. Their definitions are to some extent quantitative, but parameters of the same name may have somewhat different meanings under different laws. Also, whereas federal agencies require the presence of all three wetland parameters in order to identify a wetland, the Commission's regulations and the California Fish and Game Commission only require the presence of one of the three parameters. For this reason, federal and state wetlands are commonly referred to as three-parameter and one-parameter wetlands. In the context of wetland identification and delineation, the features of the defined wetland parameters that is crucial to appreciate is that they cannot be directly observed in the field during one or several site visits. This is most obvious in the case of quantitative definitions of wetland hydrology that require a minimum frequency and duration of inundation or soil saturation. With intensive observations, the duration of water logging could be determined for a given year, but the determination of long-term frequency would require years of observations. There are analogous problems with directly observing hydric soil in, in hydrophytic vegetation parameters that I will discuss later. The solution to the problem of identifying wetland parameters in nature is the use of field indicators. Field indicators are physical, chemical, or biological features of an area that can be easily observed or assayed and that are usually correlated with the presence of a wetland parameter. Wetland field indicators provide the basis for inferring the presence of wetland parameters and are the essential tools of, wetland delinea of the wetland delineator. For example, wetland data sheets are organized by wetland parameters, but the data recorded under each heading are observations of field indicators. Unlike parameters which are either present or not, the field indicators of those parameters are subject to error. For example, some field indicators may be created by more than one causal process. Therefore, it's possible for a field indicator to give a false positive, indicating the wetland parameter is present when it is actually absent. Other field indicators may be ephemeral or may be masked by particular environmental conditions. In this case, there's a risk of a false negative, indicating a wetland parameter is absent when it is really present. An analogy might be an ecologist inferring wildlife presence based on field signs. Characteristic tracks, if he, characteristic tracks are observed, he might infer that the habitat is occupied by coyotes. However, the tracks might be the result of a single migrating individual passing through otherwise unoccupied habitat, or the tracks might actually be dog tracks. In either event, the inference of occupied habitat would be wrong, a case of false positive. On the other hand, if the substrate is mostly vegetated or rocky, resident coyotes might not leave recognizable prints, or if observations were made after a windstorm, tracks may have been obliterated. Inferences drawn from the lack of prints would also be wrong, a case of false negative. In order to conduct a wetland delineation, wetland parameters must be defined, field indicators of those parameters must be developed, and there must be some means of avoiding wrong inferences, both false positives and false negatives. The definition of the Commission's regulations refers to the three parameters of hydrology, hydrophytic vegetation, and hydric soils. However, it does not explicitly define the parameters, identify field indicators, or give technical guidance for the field identification of wetlands. In the absence of instructions developed by the State of California, we rely heavily upon federal guidance for definitions of hydric soils and wetland veg vegetation and for field indicators of those parameters. Although the 1987 Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual is the best known guidance, it is not the only manual to have been written or adopted. Throughout the 1980s, both EPA and the Corps were working on the problem of how to delineate wetlands. In 1987, the Corps adopted the manual that is still in use, and in 1988, the EPA completed and adopted a separate manual that relied more heavily on vegetation in delineating wetlands. In 1989, a manual written cooperatively by the Corps, EPA, the Soil Conservation Service, and the Fish and Wildlife Service was adopted. It immediately became embroiled in controversy because of the perception that the new rules would result in more areas being identified as wetlands. A new manual, dubbed the Quail Manual, was proposed by the federal government in 1991. This manual was also controversial because of its stringent requirements for field evidence. 
After field testing the manuals, the four agency team concluded that the use of the 1991 manual would more than have the area delineated as wetlands <coughs> compared to the 1987 and 1989 manuals. Another group concluded that 80% of the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia would no longer be considered a wetland. The proposed manual was dropped and both EPA and the Corps adopted the original 1987 <laughs> manual. At the behest of Congress, the National Research Council reviewed the scientific basis for characterizing wetlands and in 1995 made recommendations that they thought could be the basis for a new manual. The Corps has recently responded to the need for updating their procedures by developing regional supplements to the 1987 manual that address differences in soils and climate in different ecological regions of the U.S. and a revision to the 87 manual that will better mesh with the new regional supplements is also being developed and will incorporate significant changes. Two regional supplements cover the California coastal zone. The arid west region includes those portions of the coast with a Mediterranean climate characterized by winter rainfall and summer drought with annual rainfall generally less than 20 inches and with predominantly shrub type vegetation. The western mountains, valleys, and coast region includes the sections of the California coast with higher rainfall, cooler temperatures, and coniferous forests. Although the wetland delineation that was accepted by the Commission and was the basis for the Kokorowicz Court decision was based on the methods in the 1989 manual, all recent delineations follow the basic procedures of the 87 Corps manual and the receipt regional supplements. These procedures are well tested and provide an objective basis for identifying field indicators of wetlands in the coastal zone. However, the core procedures were developed under the assumption that evidence of all three parameters would be demonstrated. In addition, the Corps and the Commission interpret the hydrology parameter differently. Therefore, staff and the Commission must always exercise independent judgment when interpreting data collected following federal guidance. I'd now like to discuss the three wetland parameters, hydrology, hydric soils, and hydrophytic vegetation in the context of the Coastal Act and the Commission's regulations. Although the presence of wetland hydrology is obviously a parameter under the Commission's wetland definitions, there is no statutory quantitative standard for the frequency or duration of standing water or saturated soils. The regulations simply require an area to be wet enough, long enough, and frequently enough to promote the formation of hydric soils or to support wetland vegetation. The fact that wetland hydrology does not have to be independently demonstrated for Coastal Commission wetland delineations has often been criticized. However, this approach was hardly unique and, in fact, was patterned after the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service definition. In a 13-year retrospective, Lewis Kowarden uh, spoke about the service's wetland classification as follows. Quote, the offers of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wetland classification maintain that it is neither reasonable nor practicable to establish a quantitative hydrologic criterion for field identification of wetlands. We still believe that in the great majority of cases, wetlands should be identified by vegetation and soils. We argue that hydrology should be used only where soil and vegetation criteria cannot reasonably be applied, such as in highly disturbed wetlands." Unquote. I agree with this assessment, and I also occasionally encounter situations in the coastal zone where standard indicators of hydric soils and hydrophytic vegetation are absent due to human activities or unreliable due to various problem situations and an assessment of hydrology is needed. In these spe special ca cases, a quantitative standard for the minimum duration of inundation or soil saturation is required. Seven days of continuous inundation or shallow soil saturation during most, more than half of all years is a reasonable minimum standard for the wetland hydrology parameter. In general, this is the minimum time necessary for anaerobic conditions to develop. To put the threshold in context, the 89 Federal Interagency Manual required at least seven days of inundation or soil saturation, as did the 88 EPA Wetland Delineation Manual. Similarly, the National Resource Conservation Service accepts seven days of inundation or 14 days of soil saturation as evidence of wetland conditions. On the other hand, the National Research Council recommended 14 days of saturation or inundation, and although the Corps accepts field indicators that can be created by much shorter periods of flooding or ponding, the regional supplements define wetland hydrology as 14 days of saturation or inundation. 
I recommend that the Commission consider less than seven days of continuous saturation or inundation during most years as characteristic of upland conditions, and 14 days or more as definitive wetland hydrology. Where available data suggest intermediate conditions, an intensive site-specific analysis will be required. At the federal level, the National Resource Conservation Service is responsible for developing standards for the identification of hydric soils. The NRCS defines hydric soils as, quote, soils that formed under conditions of saturation, flooding, or ponding long enough during the growing season to develop anaerobic conditions in the upper part of the soil, unquote. Frequent flooding or ponding for seven continuous days is considered long enough. In assessing hydric soils as a wetland parameter under the Commission's wetland definitions, it is important to note that the wetland definition in the regulations does not require the actual presence of hydric soils, but rather the presence of conditions that promote their formation. Of course, the presence of, of hydric soils is evidence of such conditions, but the parameter also could be met, for example, in a situation where wetland hydrology was recent and there had not been time for the soil to develop hydric characteristics, or where soil indicators were unreliable or destroyed by human activities. Evidence of frequent inundation for seven days is a field indicator of hydric soils accepted by the Corps and the National Technical Committee for Hydric Soils. The third parameter that characterizes wetlands in the coastal zone is wetland vegetation. Wetland vegetation is a plant community that is characterized by a predominance of hydrophytes. In order to evaluate this parameter, there must be definitions of predominance and of hydrophytes, and there must be methods of identifying both wetland characteristics in the field. A hydrophyte is any plant growing in water or on a substrate that is at least periodically deficient in oxygen as a result of excessive water content. The 1987 manual additionally defines hydrophytic vegetation as the sum total of macrophytic plant life growing in water or on a substrate that is at least periodically deficient in oxygen as a result of excessive water content. Hydrophytic vegetation is a community concept. The wetland vegetation parameter refers to the overall wetland character of the plant community. The 87 manual refers to prevalent vegetation and the Commission's regulations refer to vegetative cover that is predominantly hydrophytic. Predominance and prevalence are equivalent terms. According to the 87 manual, the predominant vegetation is the assemblage of plant species that exerts a controlling influence on the character of the plant community. Thus, vegetation that is predominantly hydrophytic meets the vegetation parameter. The concept of hydrophytic vegetation inc incorporates two somewhat counterintuitive facts. The first is that hydrophytes are generally not water-loving plants. There are actually relatively few aquatic plants that require standing water. Rather, most hydrophytes are members of water-tolerating species. A recent textbook expresses this phenomenon as the species of woody trees that are successful as opposed to tolerant in the wetland habitat are few. Most species that occur in wetlands also thrive in mesic habitats of intermediate wetness where they share space with upland species. The second critical fact is that hydrophytes are individual plants and not species. A plant growing in soil that is saturated for a significant period of time is a hydrophyte. Another individual of the same species growing on a nearby dry hillside is not a hydrophyte. It is for this reason that the vegetation parameter cannot be directly observed in the field and field indicators are needed. Although the, care, the idea of a hydrophyte is an individualistic concept, there is a practical need to characterize species as hydrophytes in order to develop field indicators can be used in wetland delineation. This dilemma was resolved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by characterizing species by the percent of individuals in the species populations that are growing in water or wet ground. The service published a list of plant species that occur in wetlands in 1988, and in 96 a draft revision was made available but never adopted. Each species is assigned a frequency distribution. In effect, this classification provides an estimate of the probability that a given individual is growing as a hydrophyte. However, the classifications are not based on sampling data. Rather, they are based on professional judgment and consensus opinion of a committee of agency biologists and represent a synthesis of submitted review comments, 
public botanical manuals and literature and field experience. The understanding of plant taxonomy and the tolerances of different species to wetland condition has changed significantly since 1988, and there is general agreement among specialists that an updated wetland plant list is needed. In 2006, the Corps was given administrative responsibility for a new list to be called the National Wetland Plant List. The draft list is available and contains many changes that will affect wetland delineation in the coastal zone. One of the many benefits of the new list is it is arranged according to ecological regions rather than artificial political boundaries. And since the frequency with which a given indicator species occurs in wetlands varies with climate, soils, and the community matrix, the wetland designations in the revised list should be much more accurate. Of the roughly 6,000 plant species in California's natural habitats, the Fish and Wildlife Service finds that 1,933 occur with some frequency in, in wetlands. The estimated frequency with which plants in the five wetland indicator categories occur are shown in the slide. The new list has dropped the numerical estimates. So obligates wetland species are almost always hydrophytes, rarely occur in wetlands. In fact, wet plants are usually hydrophytes, in fact, plants commonly occur as either a hydrophyte or as a non-hydrophyte. In fact, up plants are occasionally hydrophytes, but usually occur in uplands. Upland plants are rarely hydrophytes. If a species does not occur in wetlands in any region, it's not on the list, and it's assumed to be an obligate upland plant. When a species is loosely characterized as hydrophytic, it simply means that it possesses genetic adaptations that enable individuals to cope with excessive water and thus are capable of growing as hydrophytes. So the Fish and Wildlife Service refers to the list, the list of potential hydrophytes. The list of plant species that occur in wetlands provides the basis for the development of field indicators for the vegetation parameter. If there is a predominance of wetland indicator species, the per per parameter is considered met. Two decisions must be made. First, which classes of indicator species to use and second, how to judge predominance. Although all species on the service, services list occur in wetlands with some probability, the 87 manual only considers obligate, fact wet, and fact species when assessing the vegetation parameter. Therefore, where they are predominant, those species are presumed growing as hydrophytes and the area is presumed to be a wetland. There are two general approaches to de determining predominance. The first is called a dominance ratio, and the second a prevalence index. The dominance ratio is a primary procedure used by the Corps and is based only on the dominant species that are present. The prevalence index is an alternative approach that is based on all species present. To do calculate a dominance ratio, one first must identify the dominant species in the community. In many contexts, those species are considered to be those that provide the main physical structure to the community. So the dominance in a forest would be the most abundant trees, and the dominance in a prairie, the most common grasses, etc. However, in wetland delineation, all vegetative strata or vertical layers are considered, and dominance is considered separately for each strata. For the 50-20 rule, the actual ground cover of each species is estimated, and the species are ranked in descending order of their relative abundance. When covered, added together, those species that immediately exceed 50% of the total cover are designated dominance, as are any other species that have at least 20% cover. This slide shows the calculations needed to apply that rule. First, the actual ground cover of each species is converted to a relative cover by dividing uh, by the total cover on the ground and express, expressing the result as a percent. Relative cover is a proportion of the vegetated surface contributed by each species. If there is no bare ground, the absolute percent cover and the relative cover are the same. In the example, the estimated cover of the grass loleum is 28%, dividing by the total vegetative cover of 95 when obtains a relative cover of 30%. Relative cover always adds to 100%, regardless uh, of the total cover in the community. This standardization enables one to apply the rule to any community, whether the total vegetative cover is, say, 15% or 100%. After the relative percent cover is determined for each species, the species are placed in decreasing order of abundance, and the cum cumulative totals are calculated. And then the rule is applied. So in this case, 
those species, uh, lolium and tri the clover trifolium, total 52% are so are considered dominants. The next most abundant species here has only 17% relative cover, uh, which is less than 20, so there are only two dominants with the red check marks. The next step in determining whether wetland vegetation is pre present is assessing predominance among the dominant species. For this assessment, the core uses the dominance ratio. The dominance ratio is a ratio of the total number of wetland indicator species to the total number of species that are present. If more than 50% are classified as obligate fact, or fact, then the vegetation is predominantly hydrophytic and the wetland parameter is met. In the community shown, there are only two dominants, one of which is a wetland indicator species. And since there's not more than 50% of the cover, the area does not contain a predominance of hydrophytes and would be considered upland. Before describing the prevalence index, it's worth reviewing the notion of a weighted average. A weighted average is an average where some quantities to be average are given more influence or weight than others. A common weighting factor is abundance. For example, the number of shares of stock purchased at a particular price, or in the example on the slide, the number of students in a classroom. In this case, three classrooms were given the same test. The largest class average is C, the intermediate sized class average to B, and all the students in the small class got an A. The unweighted average of the three classes is a B. However, when the class grades are weighted for the number of students in each class, the average grade is a C because the lowest achieving class had more students. The weighting was accomplished by multiplying each class grade as represented by a numerical index by the number of students in the class, summing the products, and then dividing by the total number of students. The prevalence index is a very similar weighted average where the quantity of interest is the wetland affinity of the plants as represented by a numerical index and the weighting factor is their abundance expressed as percent vegetative cover. The example is the same plant community that was used to calculate predominance by the dominance ratio test. Species are categorized by wetland classes and each class is assigned a numerical value. The numbers one through five are assigned with one being obligate and five being upland. For each species, its index value is multiplied by its percent cover to obtain its weighted index, and then the, to determine the weight, weighted average for the community, those products are summed and divided by the total abundance. In the example, the sum of the weighted index values is 260. Dividing that by the total cover of 95 gives the weighted average index or the prevalence index of 2.7, which is defined as de de demonstrating wetland vegetation. In this example, different methods of determining predominance result in different conclusions regarding whether the, wetland, the area has wetland vegetation. This is because the subdominants have greater wetland infinities than the dominants did and change the conclusion when the whole community is considered. Such borderline cases require careful consideration of all the field data when making a recommendation. A predominance of wetland indicator species is the only field indicator of the wetland vegetation parameter. And although the use of this field indicator is generally straightforward, there are situations where it tends not to be reliable. In atypical situations where human activities such as farming remove the vegetation, wetland indicators may be lacking. And in order to make a determination, soils and hydrology have to be evaluated, historical records consulted, and the vegetation in nearby similar areas should be examined. By definition, most wetland indicator species incur in uplands with some probability. Therefore, when delineation is based only on field indicators of vegetation, there is a risk of misclassifying an upland area as a wetland when, in fact, the area seldom has an excess of water that results in anaerobic conditions. Since predominance is a community concept, there is generally little chance of error if there are many species present, especially if the species include several wetland indicator classes and are reasonably abundant. The testimony of many species is likely to be better than, and reflect the average hydrology than the evidence provided by one or two, especially if those are capable of growing over a range of conditions. Therefore, where there are few species present, the wetland vegetation indicator may be less reliable. 
The most common problem is when the vegetation is dominated by one or a few fact species, such as perennial ryegrass, that is a poor wetland indicator. In such cases, uh, a great deal more uh, evaluation has to be done considering all the, the factors that are present in the field. Another problem situation may occur where there are patches of vegetation with only one or two species present. For example, where wetland indicator species, including those listed as fact wet or obligate, grow as isolated clonal patches. Plants that spread by rhizomes may form relatively large, essentially monospecific patches, which pass the predominance tests if the sample plots are small relative to the size of the plot. However, in such cases, the species may not be representative of the vegetation community. Where such, this pattern exists, I suggest that other pertinent data be considered, and if there are no apparent topographical or hydro hydrological differences between the patch and the surrounding vegetation, I suggest the sample plot be enlarged to include the surrounding vegetation. And the core manual includes provisions for adjusting the size of the sample plot based on site conditions and professional judgment. The time at which the delineation is conducted may also affect the reliability. In California, seasonal wetlands may have different community composition during the late, late winter and spring than in the dry summer. The field indicator of vegetation may also be less reliable in disturbed areas. In, for example, wetland scientists working in Illinois found that although many common hydrophytic plants tend to be close to their expected wetness ranges on undisturbed sites, they often did not fit into their, their <coughs> ranges on disturbed sites. The expected changes in community composition that occur after disturbance also make wetland delineation difficult, especially if the disturbance removed much or all of the vegetation. Following such vegetation, excuse me, following such disturbance, the species that colonize are initially free from competitors, and the relative numbers of wetland indicator species and upland species may be simply a matter of chance or maybe a reflection of the rainfall pattern in the previous year. A source of error that may sometimes affect the reliability of the vegetation field indicator is inevitable occasional misclassification of some wetland plants. Most, most experienced field workers know of a few species that do not appear to occur in wetlands with the frequency suggested by their classification. Given that there are known sources of error in the application of the standard field indicators of wetland vegetation, how should the Commission deal with problem situations? In my recommendations, I will continue to take the conservative approach that the Commission has adopted in past actions. Plants that are listed as obligate, fact wet, or fac are presumed to be growing as hydrophytes. And the predominance of such indicator species is presumptive evidence that the area in which they are growing is a wetland. However, in recognition of the fact that field indicators are occasionally not reliable, the wetland presumption is, rebut is rebuttable by compelling evidence of upland conditions. But this is a high hurdle. Evidence of upland conditions is not simply the absence of field indicators of hydrology or hydric soils. Factors that could reasonably be considered include landscape position, topography, soil texture and permeability, presence or absence of a shallow confining layer, rainfall records, well data, photographic evidence of inundation, a history of alterations of the site, and especially soil wetness following significant rainfall. For example, if during a normal or unusually wet rainy season a questionable area is not saturated or inundated for at least seven days, this is evidence of upland rather than wetland conditions. This is not a new way of dealing with problem sites. The Commission accepted this approach in its decision regarding the presence of wetlands adjacent to Highway 90 near Bayona in Los Angeles. At that site, an asphalt parking lot was decommissioned and the asphalt removed. The subsequent winter was very wet, but there were no biological observations made at that time. The next year was a drought year, with less than four inches of rain from November to May. Nevertheless, large portions of the site had a predominance of wetland indicator species. Of the eight dominant herbaceous species present in the sample, six were fac or drier. However, the remaining two were sand spirit, an obligate annual herb, and rabbit's foot grass, a fac wet annual grass. Sandspurry occurred throughout the site and probably had the greatest ground cover of any species. 
It particularly dominated the higher, apparently drier areas, and several such areas had a predominance of wetland indicator species. However, except in patches of nearly 100% sand spurry, the wetland indicator species were intermixed with 30 species of mostly weedy upland plants. Given the extremely low rainfall and the permeable nature of the surface soil, it is extremely unlikely that the soil was more than ephemerally saturated prior to the germination and growth of the obligate and fact wet annual plants that were among the dominant species present. They clearly were growing in an upland situation during the year of the drought, and the Commission found that those areas were not wetlands. The Commission was sued, and the Commission's decision was upheld by the trial court. The presence of conditions that promote the formation of hydric soils is also sufficient evidence that an area of, is a wetland under the Commission's regulations. Under most undisturbed conditions, the field indicators of the hydric soil parameter are readily observable. The principal field indicators of hydric soils are the distinctive soil characteristics that develop when an excess of water results in anaerobic reducing conditions. Iron is leached out of the soil, producing dark colorations, and in seasonal wetlands there are alternating periods of aerobic and anaerobic conditions. As a result, iron may be concentrated in small areas called redox concentrations or models. These typical hydric soil indicators are shown on the slide. And the Technical Committee for Hydric Soil has developed a large group of field indicators of hydric soils. These field indicators are based largely on differences in coloration expressed as differences in the color characteristics, hue, value, and chroma. In order to make objective determinations of these unfamiliar technical elements of color, the delineator compares a sample of the soil to standard color charts. Each color chart corresponds to a particular hue, such as this shade of yellow-red, and the changes down the page are changes in value, the changes across the page in chroma. It's not necessary for the delineator to understand what those things mean. The soil sample is simply held so that the, show, the soil shows through the holes in the page and is moved around until a match is found. In this way, both the overall soil matrix and any models or pore linings are accurately described. This slide shows a soil sample next to the appropriate color chart that will be used to describe it. This method of describing soils is accurate and very repeatable. Experienced delineators obtain very similar results, and field indicators of hydric soils are generally straightforward to use. However, there are problem situations when the indicators may not be reliable. Rhodophomorphic features such as brown models and oxidized pore linings do not form in all soils. Soils with high pH, low concentrations of solu soluble organic carbon, or low concentrations of iron may not have these characteristic soil features, even though they have wetland hydrology. Relic features may also be a problem. The physical features of hydric soils may persist for many years after natural or human-caused alterations have removed the source of wetland hydrology. And false positive determinations may also occur in some grassland soils where the high organic content in the surface layer mimics the dark coloration that is typical of leached wetland soils. Soils that are disturbed by agricultural or by scraping or filling may also be very difficult to interpret. In summary, although standard methods have been developed, wetland delineation is not a rote exercise. In, un in uncomplicated situations, even where the rules applied without much thought, one might still harbor expectations of accurate results. However, in disturbed areas or in problem situations where the field indicators may be less reliable, professional judgment is required. When I critically review wetland delineations, I try to make sure that data and analysis are separate such as any judgments that the delineator has applied are explicit and not hidden decisions that were made in the field. One way I accomplish this is to insist that all areas with a preponderance of wetland indicator species be mapped, regardless of whether they are delineated as wetlands. When I make recommendations to the Commission they are based on my, that are based on my professional judgment, I also try to make that clear and prevent sufficient evidence that the Commission can reasonably come to an independent conclusion. Thank you. Madam Chair and Commission, um, as is apparent, Dr. Dixon knows quite a bit about wetlands and identifying them and delineating them. Uh, from time to time, you will be 
faced with decisions where whether something is a wetland or not will be the question in front of you. And we thought it was important that you understand the both the detail that's required, the technical expertise, and some of the uncertainties and the questions that will come up in that process. You know, I've been impressed over the last decade watching Dr. Dixon become an expert in this field, and we wanted you to understand that expertise and some of the issues that you may be faced with. So um, we're very fortunate to have both him and Dr. Engel on our staff to enable us to address these kinds of questions. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Blank. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair, uh, I guess the question is for uh, Dr. Lester. Uh, I, you know, this comes up in front of us uh, almost, well, quite often. And uh, uh, usually the appellants uh, uh, always point out the difference between our criteria, which I think we've just now heard for 45 minutes, and I thought it was incredibly thorough, uh, versus fish and wildlife or fish and game and um, federal standards and other standards. So uh, clearly we have our own, and I'm trying to understand, uh, uh, just for the new commissioners and remind me, what is our legal basis for defining our own standards for uh, wetland definition? Well, um, council may want to add to this too, but um, you know, one of the common problems we do encounter is the three versus one parameter approach. And one of the reasons we've had this workshop in the past and today is to help uh, keep in people's minds that we do have a one-parameter approach. And that's a common problem we see in the uh, run-up to a decision is that the wetlands were delineated under the three-parameter approach, uh, and that may not adequately address our uh, approach. Our approach is based, as Dr. Dixon showed, in our general definition of what a wetland is, uh, which sets out that only one parameter is required. And that's uh, also supported in our regulations, and so that's become the basis of it. Um, with respect to other definitions, I believe fish and wildlife and fish and game also take a one-parameter approach. So it's not out of the ordinary. Uh, the Army Corps, which is federal, does take the three-parameter approach. And, and so what's the legal basis of us uh, uh, defining it differently than the Army Corps of Engineers? That's rooted in our uh, regulations, our definition. Which one is that? 13577. 13577 is the uh, Code of uh, California Regulation Citation, Section 13577. Of what? I'm sorry. Of our regulations, resources code. Of the code. Coastal Rex. Yes. Out of Title 14? That right. That's okay. correct. Yes, Title 14. Okay. And it says what? It was which one? I'm sorry, one three. One three five seven seven. One three five seven seven uh, B, in particular, which uh, uh, goes on for quite some length in discussion discussing wetlands. And this has also been uh, litigated in part in, uh, as Dr. Dixon mentioned, the Kikurowitz decision. So, which, which upheld the commission's? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm looking at one three five seven seven B. Is it in one two or? I mean, I'm, it doesn't say one versus three. So I'm just trying to understand when we use that, where are we pointing to in the regs? Uh, I think the the critical part here. Let's see if I can find it. Um, for purposes of this section. The upland limit of a wetland should be defined as, and then it's the, the boundary between land with predominantly hydrophytic cover and land with predominantly mesophytic or xerophytic cover, referring to the vegetation. The boundary between land that is predominantly hydric and soil that is predominantly non-hydric, or in the case of wetlands without vegetation or soils, the boundary between land that is flooded or saturated at some time during years of normal precipitation and land that is not. So that or is uh, the critical word, whereas in federal it's and. Okay, so it's the or versus and in 13577. That is where we derive our authority for taking one of the three rather than the three. Yes, and, and the... Right. Is that, I just want to make... That, I, because this, for 
while this might seem a little arcane to fellow commissioners, this will come up all the time, um, is that to summarize Dr. Dixon's 45 minutes, appellants will bring that one up all the time. And I just want to make sure we could go to the source of what our authority is. We do have the authority. It is here. I have finally found the word. It is or versus and. Um, and that is in the coastal wrecks. So I just wanted to make the point. Uh, we will hear from appellants time and again about the core of engineer standards and how can we have other standards. The answer is we now have found out how we could have other standards. The coastal regs, according to staff uh, and council's interpretation, that or versus and is the key differentiation. Is that correct, council? Yes, it is. Thank you. Commissioner Novell. As a person who works in the Department of Transportation here in California, we deal with wetlands all the time. And I have to say, it's an excellent presentation. As a former field biologist uh, in the days before the, the Wild West days before the, the field manual from the Corps, uh, it's, it's uh, interesting to see what's happened in the, in the intervening decades. Uh, but uh, we had a recent project. We had three different wetlands definitions all standing on their own law. Uh, we had the Corps definition. We had the Coastal Commission definition. We had the fishing game. We had others. And so we had three different boundaries we had to deal with, both these all using the term wetlands, and we had to design around that and orchestrate our compliance with it. So I, I guess I would look for every opportunity where particularly state agencies could work together, and apparently you have done that because you have everybody else's definitions up there on the screen, to see uh, to what extent we can uh, rationalize and explain differences so that it's easier for compliance as well as for enforcement. Commissioner Brennan. You have to push hard. Got it. I was just going to say that um, uh, I think the opportunity to have this archived and on the website and up in a box where somebody could pull it up. I know we had some students here that kind of left the room, but they could learn a lot about wetlands. I know I can certainly go back to that and use it as a, as a, a valuable tool. So I, 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 while this did seem a little bit more scientific, uh, it certainly brought some good thoughts to me. And I know in the future I'll be able to reference it and go back and as, as a tool. So I hope that it will get a significant place on the website. And as we add these um, more of these kind of workshops, maybe it could be on the front uh, access on the front site so that uh, as these other things come up we can deal with it also. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Kinsey. Yes, uh, Mr. Dixon, I was interested in the situation when we have human caused concentrations uh, that result in these conditions, any one of these conditions. How do we how do we address the creation, sort of the man-made creation of a wetland environment uh, under the Coastal Act. Well, I, I take it, Commissioner, that you're referring to um, not artifacts, but the fact that under the humans can create situations where you actually get a wetland. Right. So you put a culvert in under a road, and that outfall <coughs> has, uh, you know, is graded in such a way that it creates a concentration of water, and, and the result is one or more of these conditions. And uh, to my knowledge, to date, the commissioner has treated them as any as they would any other kind of wetland. Now, occasionally, an applicant will say, "Well, this this wetland is uh, being created by um, a artificial source of water," and um, so my approach to that has been to say, "Turn it off." If you can turn it off, uh, we don't have a wetland anymore. If you can't turn it off. It's what the Corps would call a new normal situation, and that's just a, another wetland. So a new normal becomes uh, the basis for us to consider it as we would any more natural situation. Thank you. And Commissioner Kinsey, I may add, um, we have worked proactively with applicants and um, uh, project developers to be clear that if a wetland is created through a water quality uh, function, for example, that that would not become a source of difficulty in the future because its purpose was to become a wetland as a water quality feature. So when you have the opportunity, um, you know, just because it will be a wetland doesn't mean it's going to create an issue in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Simmer. Is your mic on? When the light, when the red light is 
off, you're on. When the light is red, <laughs> when the red light is on, it means thank stop. You. We can't hear you. Thank you. Um, thank you to Dr. Dixon for that very thorough refresher. Um, I, I just wanted to note, following up on um, uh, Commissioner Blank's uh, inquiry as to where where exactly this difference is in terms of how we define versus how the uh, federal agencies may define. Um, it's interesting because this, this has come up so many times over so many, many years, and, and the fact that it still is a point of confusion uh, when applicants come up here on appeal is, is what's um, something that I would like to see addressed. I know that we have communicated many, many times to local agencies what the commission standards are, but uh, I'm wondering if there's um, something additional we can do uh, in terms of um, making sure that they know when they're processing an application that they should be considering, if it's in the coastal zone, that that analysis has to be done as part of the local application process pursuant to our standards, I think would avoid a lot of problems for people. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stone. Uh, no. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Burke. No, it's me. I know what you're going to say. I'd like to thank Dr. Dixon for the uh, presentation also, but what, what always comes to my mind is uh, the use of common sense. A number of years ago, when I was first on this commission, the Department of Highways asked for permission to extend the 91 freeway into Marina Del Rey into an area which was uh, covered by a boat storage yard, tennis courts, and a nursery, all of which were concreted, surfaced. We issued a preliminary permit. They went in, they tore up the uh, concrete and the asphalt and came back in for the permit to construct. And in the interim, it had rained. And the opposition opposed the building permit because they said the land had become a wetland. Now, I'm a great proponent of wetlands, but how can you say it's a wetland when it had asphalt over it for 30 years? Obviously, there was some basis. Do you remember that one, Dr. Dixon? I believe that's probably the LA-90 uh, example that I gave in the, in the presentation, sir. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the commission decreed that it was not a wetland. And there, I thought, you remember it was a two-and-a-half-hour debate. You, you, and it went to court. Right. So I just want to make my fellow commissioners aware that definition is one thing, but application is a whole different thing. Commissioner McClure. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, coming from the part of California that gets sometimes upwards of 110, 115 inches of rain a year, it's um, very it's very wet, and so the the discussion becomes that it's easy to have standing water for more than seven days because sometimes it rains 15 or 20 days in a row, and when that rain happens and the water stands then the entire Pacific Northwest becomes one wetland that could be defined as the hydric soil. And with the issue of no development within a wetland unless it's essential, it then gets really conflicted in small rural communities. And I'm not sure how we address that because it's, it, it pushes right up against the ability for people to be able to use their property. And so, so, and then also on the man-made wetland, because of our community's water 
inundation. There have been ditches that are made to try to, to, to preserve, and then those ditches then become identifiable wetlands because it's also a very wonderful place for all the plants to grow. So I don't know how I can go back to my community and say we're 100% wetland. Well, happily, Commissioner, um, despite the fact that in our neck of the woods we get a lot of rainfall, um, it's not all wetlands and it's not all hydric soils. Uh, the low areas uh, are wet and, and do develop wetland characteristics. And in fact, we have a lot more wetlands than they have in Phoenix. Um, but the whole area um, is not wetlands. Now, it does cause us some problems in terms of identifying wetlands because because of the, the amount of rainfall that we get, a lot of species that might be good indicators, not, a lot of plant species that might be good indicators in other parts of the world are able to grow up slopes like blackberry, for example, which is not a particularly good indicator of wetlands. And so we have to really pay attention when we do these delineations that we don't come up with uh, something that doesn't make sense. And so I take it as one of my responsibilities is to try and make sure that these delineations uh, make sense and the commission isn't in the awkward position of having false positives or false negatives uh, in your determinations. Thank you. Commissioner Plank. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair for Director Douglas, uh, excuse me, Director Lester. Um, uh, let me just uh, make a tactical request, and I think it concatenates a couple of the other requests. Uh, number one, uh, this uh, presentation was formally W-4. Uh, can I ask that we append the PowerPoint presentations as an amendment to W-4? Um, because I thought they were a great summary of uh, incredible detail that enhanced uh, the, the written description in W-4 and think that to make it a permanent part of the record would help both applicants and other commissioners to refer to it. And then the second request is to post it uh, prominently on our page of with the Coastal Act and regs. And then the third uh, request, um, if possible, can you amend W-4 to include staff's response on just the legal question of what the basis of authority is. So we now have in one location both the um, biological definition of wetlands but also the legal definitions of wetlands as per staff council that we now have a single place for commissioners when we're confused up here about applicants and appellants to kind of refer and that we could also uh, uh, refer both agents and applicants to the specific document on the website and then I think it would be an enormously uh, powerful educational tool for both the public commissioners and the and the rest uh, is that okay with the uh, director yes we can do all of those um, okay. and in fact we'll tie it in with the information that we already have I believe that would be great this was incredibly uh, this we will be referring to this thing for the next 10 years and and I really appreciate the effort put into it I, 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 again both the the presentation and the staff's answer on the legal basis I think covers about 95 percent or more of the questions I've heard in the last five years and just would have been great to have this and now that we do it's just uh, wonderful so thank you for all the hard work thank you and I just want to call the commissioners um, attention to the section in um, that was in W4 about why do we care about wetlands. Um, Dr. Dixon's presentation was terrific and the premise behind it is uh, not just that we're required to care about wetlands and preserve them because that's what the act says, but there are uh, very, very important and valuable characteristics of wetlands and I don't know what the percentage is now for you. For years we said there was less than 10 percent of the wetlands left in California and so it isn't simply an academic and legal exercise that we go through as we balance or, or we look at the protecting wetlands when we have a project proponent a project before us but um, it has a lot of they have a lot of very valuable and really essential characteristics for the health of our environment um, that we are charged with protecting so um, it's here I just it wasn't in your presentation and I want to just call commissioners and the public's attention to that section uh, why do we care about wetlands and um, if there are no other commissioners, um, Marsha Hanscom, you would like to address the commission on this, and you can have um, two minutes. 
Honorable Commissioners, Marcia Hanscom with the Wetlands Defense Fund, and I too am um, pleased to have observed Dr. Dixon's amazing um, growth of information and knowledge over the years. When I first started coming to the commission, you didn't have any ecologists on staff, and so it's been refreshing this last decade or a little more than that to have someone who um, understands wetlands and has been able to put this forward. And I just want to put a couple of pieces of information into your um, into your pockets related to this. The, um, often we have consultants who are attempting to make something not a wetland. And again, it's more than 95% of our wetlands on the coast as of 10 years ago have been destroyed. So it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can to not just protect the wetlands, but buffers around them. It's really an interesting um, it's fact that the, the organisms that depend on wetlands do not stay within the wetland boundaries no matter who determines what those are. And so we have to really look at it as an ecosystem. At the same time, we have politics that have actually determined what a wetland is. It's all politics. Yes, there's some science, no question, but the list of plants that are in the Fish and Wildlife Service list, the Army Corps definition, I've heard all of the history of how, from the people who were there as to how those definitions actually came to be. So those are the definitions. Those are what we have to legally go by. And I would like to make sure that you look at the Krakorowicz decision because that is settled law. The, the Krakorowicz is, um, challenged the Coastal Commission and I think that that settled appeals decision is very important for you because the Coastal Commission prevailed in a very good way, I believe, and that one parameter approach is very, very strongly determined and explained. So please get a chance to read that when you get a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. 